Hi, I welcome to Silicon Valley Health Institute. I am coming in from afar without electricity, so I'm an unseen host. But this is Susan Downs, and my co-host, whom you can see, is Stephen Falks. Today, we're honored to have Dr. Barn here, who will tell us about pain and how to handle it. He is a naturopathic physician, certified nutrition specialist, and a co-owner and medical director of Born Integrative Medical Specialist. He's the director of product development and scientific advisor for the Allergy Research Group. He's also a medical wellness advisor for the International Medical Wellness Association. He graduated from Bestier University in Seattle, Washington, in 2010. He completed his residency there for natural health and his 13 teaching clinics. He's had rotations at Evergreen and the Harborview Medical Center's emergency medical departments and the Virginia Mason Hospital's Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Spine Clinic. He's extensively published, has appeared in multiple news and radio shows, and lectured as an expert for the National Psoriasis Foundation and National Arthritis Foundation. He lectures at medical conferences across the country and internationally. He's also studied with some experts in London who are very knowledgeable. <clears throat> His clinical focus is in utilizing integrative medicine to treat families of all ages who have complex chronic diseases with a strong interest in difficult and refractory cases of any condition. So anyway, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction and for inviting me to speak to you here today. The, my plan is to talk at you for 45 minutes, go through this presentation. We'll open up the floor to some questions for 15, 20 minutes to the second half of the conversation and then go ahead and um, open up the floor to more questions. So it's not just me, you know, rambling on for two hours. So let's go ahead and get to it. Here are my disclosures and all the stuff I'm kind of involved with and the objectives really would be to understand the different types of pain along with uh, common causes. That way it doesn't really matter uh, what kind of pain the person has, we can um, think of strategies and interventions to treat them and hopefully you know, get them a lot better. Treatment options typically um, for chronic pain, they fall into six major categories, uh, which most of you um, practitioners are already aware of, right? Pharmacologic, physical medicine, behavioral medicine, neuromodulation, interventional, surgical approaches. And optimal patient outcomes really come from a multiple disciplinary team, multiple approaches. We're not talking to someone who sprained their ankle or they broke their finger. These are people who have chronic pain regardless of the cause. And in my experience, a lot of times with the way the United States system has been set up and in conventional medicine, right? It's just, you know, one treatment approach, maybe some physical therapy, maybe some occupational therapy, um, you know, and then a bunch of medications of that that's work. That's not working. That's not how we typically get people with very complex chronic pain pictures better. It needs to be multidisciplinary. And we'll go through all of that and how I um, treat patients. Then we're gonna go through discussing most of the common evidence-based pharmacological and non-pharmacological options to improve patient outcomes and quality of life. And it's not just evidence-based, right? Yeah, and there's a pushback in a lot of medicine, even conventional medicine for more clinical-based medicine. You know, when you see these trials and they'll say, well, this intervention to look at these outcomes was not efficacious. Uh, in the majority of people, but what about those people that did benefit from it? Or what about people like me or you um, other listeners out there who've treated you know, thousands of patients? That's clinical-based medicine. Just because there's not a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial showing efficacy in say homeopathics or whatever, doesn't mean they don't work. It just means maybe the right study hasn't been done yet. And we'll go through that um, and, and what actually does work. Let's kind of go through what I think are depressing factoids right? It affects more than 100 million people in the U.S. It accounts for 20% of outpatient visits, 12% of all prescriptions, and an indirect and indirect cost to the United States. It's $100 billion, uh, and that's um, from 2010. It's, I'm, I, that's the, the most current information I could really find. I'm sure it's probably doubled that now. Pain-related expenditures, right? Direct costs and lost wages in the U.S., they exceed cancer, heart disease, diabetes combined. So essentially it's costing people more money directly to them as well as insurance companies and then the employers, right? Cause they have to take time off of work. Then the top, some of the top leading diseases, right? Cancer and heart disease and then diabetes. 
In other words, a lot of people write on, on disability. And because when I come across quotes from people that can say it better than I, I, um, I usually just read it to people. Um, and this is great. The use and misuse of opioids for management of chronic pain is a major concern with problems arising from their multiple adverse side effects, including drug dependency, drug diversion, under treatment of chronic pain symptoms for fear of opioid abuse. Chronic pain is thus a major medical social issue affecting the quality of life of individual patients, their friends, families, the workforce, and society in general. So here even this came out of up to date, right? A very conventional database. Most hospitals use it. I use it in my practice that they're even talking about this is a major problem, but it's easy in a seven minute visit to just be like, all right, you're in pain. Here's a script. And this has ultimately led to the opioid you know, abuse and crisis, which has now gotten a lot of backlash, fortunately. And people now are trying to look for alternatives and not just quickly going to the medications. So right, the main categories, neuropathic pain, musculoskeletal pain, some kind of inflammatory pain, it's caused by infections, uh, you know, tick-borne illnesses would be a common one, right? right Lyme disease, um, urquetia, those kind of things, arthropathies. Then there's a mechanical and a compressive, right? Someone has a compound fracture, um, they get in a car accident, they played a sport. Those ones sometimes are a little harder to treat. Um, you know, I got someone that comes in and they're 80 years old and they have a, you know, compression fracture in their spine. Now they got all this radiculopathy. Um, that's a little bit more difficult to treat sometimes. Um, and then you got to note that when people have chronic pain, they're usually having overlapping of all of these. And we'll go through how I assess this and how I try to help people. So for me, I'm a rather pedantic person sometimes, and I'm very particular. Uh, and when it comes to pain, I'm very particular. And I like to use this universal pain scale because pain is very subjective. And as we know, most women, right, they have a higher pain tolerance than men. You know, men could never deal with childbirth, for example. We'd be crying up a storm. So when people come into me and they just, you know, are telling me all this pain, they're like, well, my, and you give them the pain scale, zero, no pain, 10 pain. They're like, oh, it's 10, it's 10. And I'll say, really, is it? So I actually have this, and it's when I used to have a physical practice in California, uh, my wife and I sold that. Uh, practice to our associates. And now I've had a telehealth, 100% telehealth practice for the last uh, three years. And so I have patients all over the United States, all over the world. I share my screen with them when I'm in my virtual appointment and ask them, you know, do you really have a pain 10? Because if you look at this, this pain 10 means worst pain possible. And look, your activity means you are completely bedridden. And when this helps to normalize their pain picture and gives me and themselves a more accurate reflection of their pain, they'll say, they'll say to me, you know, actually, you know what? I don't really have a 10. I'm actually more like a six. And I always ask people, what is your pain average? And when is it at its best? And what it's at your worst? And of course, what makes it, you know, the, the whole seven elements of the HPI, right? You know, what makes it better? What makes it worse? You know, those kind of things. But this is nice because... It's also good to use it for when, if you're to, to assess your therapies. Well, you were averaging a seven out of 10 before you saw me, and we did these couple things. What are you averaging now? And, you know, and they'll say, oh, you know, probably a four, but I mean, there are days that I flare and I get up to an eight, uh, but I'm averaging four. This, you can go on, you, this is Googleable. You just literally type in Google Universal Pain Assessment Tool, and this will come up. You can download it, um, print it. Uh, it's it's readily available. You'll see it a lot in hospitals <coughs> and pain clinics as well. So what I'm doing to approach the patient is, you know, first of all, it's a very thorough evaluation with a very comprehensive history of the pre presenting illness. And of course, when I was in physical practice for 10, for seven years, um, physical exam was crucial, right? You know, neurological exam, um, you know, assessing, you know, their, their, their grade of their pain, muscle strength testing, those kind of things. So I could elucidate what's going on. Now, I obviously have to rely more on, you know, say specialists or, you know, who I might have to send them to. Typically, by the time they've seen me with their chronic pain, they've seen everybody. So they have all the CT reports and the MRIs and the x-rays and, you know, um, and they've seen everybody and they're getting referred to me because they've got some kind of refractory pain. But to really elucidate the underlying etiologies, that's crucial. 
all too often, it's so easy just to give a script or send them to physical therapy without really know what's going on. And when I was at the Virginia Mason Hospital's spine clinic, that's what that clinic was. These were people with bizarre pain pictures that were not responsive to just about anything. So they would get sent to the physiatrist and he would, with his team of physical therapists, would go through and try to figure out what their pain syndrome really was coming from and not just reflexively giving them pain meds. Um, I love the standardized pain scales, big into assessing psychosocial factors, right? If you have someone who is depressed and they've got no social network, particularly now with say COVID-19, everybody's getting this, you know, quarantine burnout and fatigue, then it's going to be really hard to get them 100% better or 80% better because of the fact that, you know, you've got to consider that psycho-emotional state, right? Positive people tend to do better than say the more negative people or people who have no support. I'm also big into what have you tried? You know, what's worked, what's not worked? Why? Uh, how many times have we all seen a patient that comes in and says, oh yeah, I took turmeric, you know, didn't do anything. Well, did you? Well, what kind of turmeric? How many milligrams? How often did you take it? How many times a day do you take it? How much were you taking? And then they'll say, oh, I went to Whole Foods and I grabbed whatever they had. It was on sales. Oh, they'll show me the bottle. It's 250 milligrams. Well, I was taking one a day and I wasn't regular with it. That's why it wasn't working. But people with chronic pain, you know, is, is difficult to treat, whether it's pharmacologic therapy, pharmacotherapy or herbs or nutrients. It's because you got to get ahead of the pain but in order to basically start tapering down. So giving someone 250 milligrams of turmeric isn't going to do it. That's what's been shown in trials. And that's what I've seen clinically. You got to get massive doses into someone to start getting pain under control and then back off of what you're giving. Then of course, you know, more approach to the patient is x-rays, MRI, CTs. Um, those are obviously very important. Insurance doesn't like them, right? So you always have to do an x-ray, even though you know that's not going to help you. They don't like to cover it unless you, and yeah, they don't like to cover these more expensive diagnostic imaging like the MRI or the CT um, because they didn't run an x-ray first. That's just the medical system puts you through, you and your patient through the ringer. So standard testing, right? And this is what I do because I am known as a vampire to a lot of phlebotomists in the world. And it's not because I like poking people. It's because I'm getting people who are very messed up, so to speak, and I'm trying to find out what's going on. Plus, generally speaking, right, people are empirical by nature. They like numbers. So I use these as a motivation tool. So if I have really high inflammatory markers and I'm telling someone to take three grams of turmeric every day, they know that I'm going to test them in three months. They're like, oh, I got to Dr. Gorn told me, you know, I'm, I got to take this turmeric and uh, he's going to retest me. I need to get that number down. That CRP has got to come down. They're more likely to stick with the recommendations that I'm making. If they can see one, they're going to feel obviously subjective changes, but then you can have objective parameters like blood tests. So I run, you know, your standard test, right? CBC, thyroid, you know, CMP. Inflammatory marker. The reason I run a lot of inflammatory markers is because, number one, the body has a lot of different ways to make inflammation. And how many times have we seen a patient who can barely walk into your exam room and yet their inflammatory markers are normal? Then you get someone who's not even in that much pain, but they might have, you know, a um, fair amount of neuropathy or something. And you're like, yeah, my knee hurts. And then their SED rate is 30. So I like to test a lot of these you know, CRP, um, high sensitive CRP, C, CRP, sorry, I should say CRP, said rate, homocysteine, uh, because this is a neuroinflammatory marker. So if someone has, um, it's, it's, it's evidence for association with cardiovascular disease isn't that strong. That's kind of, kind of been dismissed over the years, but it's got a strong association with dementia and neurological disease, neurological disorders. And it is damaging to the nervous system and nerves themselves. So if that's elevated, if someone's coming in with neuro, uh, neuropathic pain, I'm going to want to get that homocysteine under control. And then, of course, things like IL-16, TNF-alpha. These aren't necessarily routinely run, right? They're more in research trials. But you can still run them through conventional labs, and I do, um, because uh, especially if you have like some seronegative spinal arthropathy, then I run these. If the person's on a lot of prednisone, if they're on, you know, a, a biologic or some kind of DMARD, I may run them knowing that they might be spurously low, 
but it's also helpful that if they're on a biologic, they're on methotrexate or prednisone, and these are still high, we still have work to do. So I usually get a baseline and then maybe three or six months later, I'll test some of these. And I don't test them, retest them if they're normal. Um, there's no reason. I only keep retesting people's abnormals until I get them under control and they're optimized. Big fan of hormones, which we'll discuss later, right? These are all steroid hormones and these are the body's natural steroid hormones. So you can actually use these in lieu of prednisone or even to taper people off prednisone. But I don't like giving people hormones unless I know what their actual blood values are. I'm not going to give hormones if they don't need it. How many times someone comes in and they've actually with chronic pain and they've never been worked up for an autoimmune disease or it was, you know, kind of um, half, half done, right? They, they might've had a rheumatoid factor, but never a CCP, right? Which is very more specific for rheumatoid arthritis or they never even had an ANA panel. And then that's what's going on. Of course, you can have seronegative spondyloarthropathies like ankylosing spondylitis or something, um, but those are diagnosis of exclusions. Tick-borne illnesses, and this can be, this is on certain people's radars depending on your patient population, also where you practice. So when I practiced in Connecticut for a few years, my wife's also a doctor. She and I were seeing a lot of, um, you know, tick-borne illnesses, you know, Babesia, Borrelia, Anaplasma, or Lichiosis, you know, the list goes on and on. So in that world, it's a lot on people's radars, but if you practice, you know, say in central California, it may not be, but, or even in, you know, if you practice in the Bay Area where we used to practice, Lyme disease is very prevalent up in the Oakland and Berkeley Hills, but people don't necessarily think of it because they think of ticks maybe being in the Midwest, upper Midwest or upper New England, but they're very prevalent. And in places like California, they never get very cold. It never gets real hot. These things are all year round. So a good history will help elucidate whether you should be testing people for tick-borne illnesses. Did you have any travel? Were you hiking? Were you camping? Do you have a dog that brought ticks in? You know, um, particularly during the nymph stage of tick-borne illness, if anybody's ever seen a nymph, they're about the size of a pinhead. And they're, the probability of someone find that on their body is pretty small. They might shower and it might just come off and now they're sick. Um, you know, and the erythema migraines only is present in about 30% of people. So it's really important. And also what's endemic in that area, right? Um, you're not gonna test for rickettsia if someone's, you know, in Florida, it's not really present there. The other thing would be Lyme is tricky. And this isn't a talk about Lyme, but Lyme is tricky because there's multiple species, not just Borrelia burgdorferi that cause Lyme. Um, it depends what part of the United States, were they in the UK? And you got to try to find a lab that can test those. And it's hard, right? Because it's an intracellular spirochete. So sometimes what we, we're not, PCR can help it, but it's not very um, sensitive for, the, for picking these up. So we run antibodies. I use a lab called, and I have no affiliation with them, called Immunosciences. And this is an FDA CLIA approved lab. And they will run, they have a tick-borne panel where they run, you know, four or five kinds of Lyme. They run, they run a number of tick-borne illnesses. Patient pays out of pocket. It's very reasonable, more than what they would pay out of pocket at Quest or LabCorp. And then they submit that receipt to their insurance for reimbursement. Um, thyroid panel, super important, particularly running antibodies. Typically speaking, um, people who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis they will present with much more musculoskeletal pain than the individual who has um, uncomplicated hypothyroid disease. In the conventional world, right, they never test titers, right? They never test thyroid peroxidase antibodies because they say, well, if 70% of all cases in North America are Hashimoto's, then why test it? This is what, when I trained and rotated in my residency with conventional doctors, I said, well, if they have an autoimmune disease, they're more likely to have another autoimmune disease. Wouldn't you want to know if you had an autoimmune disease? And then they kind of harumph and say, well, yeah, you know, but for them, and I'm not knocking conventional medical doctors. I love them. I train with them. I use them all the time. It's just a different lens that um, someone like me typically sees things through because in the conventional world, right, standard operating procedures, you're going to get Synthroid, right, whether you have Hashimoto's or not. In my world, we're not just going to go right to synthetic T4, it's particularly if someone has Hashimoto's, they respond to different therapies. And then all these other markers like vitamin D, methylmalonic acid, and B12. I like to combine the two to get a more sens sensitive picture of uh, B12 status. And it doesn't mean I'm running all of these on every patient, 
the history of the intake, the intake will dictate which lab tests I'm going to run. B6, you know, RBC folate, ionized calcium, magnesium, celiac panels. If they're on a gluten-free diet for two or three weeks, right, serology is um, useless. They actually would have to challenge it. But you can run these genetic tests for HLA, DQ2, and DQ8. Genetics don't change, right? They're either born with them or not. And if that's positive, and I like to use um, the lab that is, um, I have no affiliation with them, called Prometheus. They're in San Diego. And the reason I like to use them for the DQ2, DQ8 is they run all the subtypes and then they give a risk stratification based upon the person's genetics, how likely they are to have celiac disease, 98%, 50%, 0%. And insurance covers it. And those are really helpful. And if you look at, people will say, well, you know, how are you getting all these covered by insurance? And if the, for those that deal with insurance, I don't accept insurance, but I do have patients that are on insurance. I give them super bills for reimbursement. I run a lot of labs. Is that the key is when you're working at someone's differential diagnosis, you can load that lab request up with a ton of diagnoses because those labs will get associated with certain ICD 10s and insurance is more likely to cover them. If you're actually going to diagnose them, right? Insurance companies don't like if you res put six diagnosis codes down because they think that you're just purposely trying to make the patient look more complicated than they really are. And then upcoding so you can get more from back from insurance. So never use really four or five codes unless you want to get flagged. But when it comes to the world of labs, you could load that thing up. And these are the typical codes I use oh. to get uh, labs covered by people's insurances. And I've had hundreds of patients come back to me and be like, man, what did you do? I got this $30 bill and I'm used to getting thousand dollar bill from labs because it has to do with how you code. Other testing, these would not be things that I would do necessarily, right? They're out of, outside of my skill set, like nerve conduction velocities, electromyograms, those are usually physiatrists and neurologists, interventional testing, the microbiome um, would be something I would do, stool testing. And then for those patients that, you know, come in and they just got these bizarre pain pictures, right? Um, which is basically pain sensitization syndrome, also known as central sensitization. So these are individuals that there's a derangement in the communication with the central nervous system, the spine, the nerves, and the brain, and how pain is interpreted. And you've probably seen these patients, or maybe you have it yourself, where they could drop a, you know, a hammer on their hand, and they're like, that didn't really hurt that much. But they might just get the wind, they go outside and the wind grazing the top of their skin will send them into a downward spiral and a flare where they're bedridden. And obviously these are extremes to prove my point. And we see it all the time. So our job as clinicians is to undo that derangement and make the communication more normal and they won't have these um, bizarre pain uh, pictures anymore. And this usually happens with people who've just had a lot of chronic pain for a long time. They're not typically people who have only been in pain for a little while. And then we need to be aware of this, right? So again, not, not just putting on the holistic hat and not just seeing it through one lens is that up to 75% of people who have chronic pain, they also have depression and anxiety. Is it chicken or the egg? Were they depressed and or anxious and that caused them to have more chronic pain or they have chronic pain, which causes them? For me, I usually ask that to someone, you know, I'll say, were you, did you have depression before this? Were you an anxious person before this? Um, and many times they'll say, yeah, I was a little bit an anxious person, but really this pain is what's really gotten into me. And then insomnia and fatigue, and that's a negative feed forward cycle, right? They're in pain, they can't sleep, they're fatigued, which causes more pain, they can't sleep, fatigue, and then you can see now they're just a train wreck and then it's our turn, our, our job to fix all of these things. So this brings me to kind of how I view the world of complex pain pictures. It doesn't mean I'm gonna have every single specialist on board at one time, but at least, you know, maybe a, a mix, a smorgasbord, if you will, of these people I'll do. So you're gonna have the naturopathic physician, a chiropractor, an acupuncturist, massage, energetic, Reiki, you know, craniosacral therapy, um, Rolfing, Alexander technique, these kind of people. And again, we're not using them every time. It's like I go through the list and try to peel away the layers. You know, physiatrists, which I think is a really underutilized medical doctor or DO who specializes in musculoskeletal pain. I like physiatrists a lot because they're not surgeons. 
So they're going to try to do everything possible to get the surgeon, get the patient out of the surgeon's hands. So if you have a good physiatrist, and they're also pain specialists, so they have advanced training in medication management, so they're much better at managing pain meds um, than the GP or the family practice or the internist. Um, so I like them a lot. And if they say the person needs surgery, then they probably do. Of course, they can't forget physical therapy, OT, I'm a big fan of um, orthopedics, neurology, right, mind body techniques. And so let's go through what is typically done. And my apologies if most of you already know this, um, the conventional approach, right? Um, as we said earlier, your treatment options basically fall into six categories. You're either going to give them meds, you're going to do physical medicine, some kind of behavioral medicine, neuromodulation, interventional, like someone going in and doing injections in your spine, or surgical. And I'm not against these. These are great. But if you look at the studies, even when all of these are combined, you're only getting a 30% reduction in pain. That's not very good. So the most common thing, right, again, is pharmacological approach. It's just, it's the easiest. So they give you a non-opioid analgesic, you know, they'll give you an opioid, they'll give you all an alpha-2 adrenergic, antidepressants, antileptics, muscle relaxers, you know, NMDA receptor antagonists, DMARDs, steroids. You can see where this is going. They just kind of blast you with meds and the body is not stupid. It will, it may keep people under control for a little while, but the body will just go around that pathway and produce more pain. Other things that you know go awry would be the fact of just high tolerance, right? People build tolerance to these meds and they're not without their side effects. I use some of these meds, um, but I'm not gonna use them you know, uh, to the point where someone's getting an ulcer or blasting out their liver from too much Tylenol or causing kidney damage from too much ibuprofen. You know, and if you've, anybody's ever not used these medicines for a long time, either on themselves or someone else, like let's just take ibuprofen, for example. Say you haven't taken it in a couple of years and all of a sudden you have a headache and then you take 200 milligrams. This stuff is like a miracle. It's like, oh my God, where's this ibuprofen been my whole life? Well, that's the way it is for people in chronic pain is they've just been on it for so long, it's not really working. But if you get them either off of it for a while or you can get them on such a low dose with all the natural therapies, the medicines actually work a lot better. So here's what's supposed to happen, right? Here's the medication ladder, which is not followed very often. And you know, I'll let you read this on your own time. If, you're, if someone's in mild pain, you're supposed to give them something like aspirin, an NSAID, or Tylenol. I don't like Tylenol for pain for a few reasons. Number one, it's a great antipyretic. It's not that effective for pain until people start getting into these gram doses, right? And we all know that the number one cause of acute hepatic failure in the United States is Tylenol overdose. So when I used to rotate with geriatricians, all their patients were all on three grams a day of Tylenol for their pain. And I'm like, why are they on three grams of Tylenol? They're like, well, four will cause them liver failure and they're on all these other meds and this is the safest one. I was like, but wait, there's so many problems with Tylenol. They're like, yeah, well, it's better than an opioid. It's better than an NSAID and I'm getting ulcers. And it's just not that effective as a pain reliever in my opinion and my experience. Um, plus, it's too risky because then right, you're depleting glutathione and you're just kind of just basically putting fuel on the fire. Then there's opioids, right? If mild to moderate pain, you're supposed to give them opioids, some codeine, some tramadol, you know, which is ridiculous. Someone has mild pain, they shouldn't need opioids. Even moderate pain, they really shouldn't need opioids, in my opinion and experience. Maybe short term, like the, how the medications were invented. They were supposed to get people a lot of pain. Um, short term, not supposed to be left on it indefinitely. Then, right, the big guns, the dangerous things like fentanyl, morphine, you know, extended release oxycontins. Um, but how often is this medication ladder really followed? Not very often. Most of the time, they're just given straight up opioids. So, the, really, the integrative approach is the evidence it points to a combo of therapies much more effective, evaluating the cause and knowing the type of pain. Is it nociceptive versus neuropathic? And that's what helps me. You know, I'm not a pain specialist. I just have a lot of experience and had a lot of um, experience in my residency and just see a lot of people with chronic pain for various reasons. But I need to know the etiology or etiologies of their pain in order to treat their pain more effectively. So here's the kind of bucket list in this. In, as a naturopathic physician, we have this thing called a therapeutic order where we do the least invasive, least aggressive therapies first, saving the most evasive last, right? Drugs and um, surgery is the last resort. 
That being said, you know, you got to also assess the patient, right? If they're in a wheelchair because of their pain, you know, maybe giving them some massage is, is not what they need right now. They need to get their pain much under control, then adding in massage. So there's always hydrotherapy and balneal therapy, which I love. I mean, just look at this. I think this is a picture I took from Iceland or something. And if you just look at that, just look how peaceful and relaxing and therapeutic that is, um, these spas. Then there's physiotherapy, right? Which is any kind of manual therapy. So here we have, right, chiropractic manipulation, spinal manipulation, um, and you could do interferential, ultrasound. You know, I'm a big fan of low level laser, also called cold laser. Um, basically has no side effects. You can get the ones that just have a straight beam, but those really only work for pinpoint pain, like someone's got carpal tunnel. But you can get these larger devices, which might cover an entire joint. The drawback of those is just that they're expensive. Um, so the initial investments there, most in insurance pays so poorly for cold laser. Most doctors that I know that have the devices, even when I had them in my practice, you, you keep it nominal. $30 a treatment. And then, you know, within a year, you've had that device paid off because those big ones, they can cost $10,000 or more. And then, you know, the American College of Physicians, I love this, in 2017, finally came out, right? A top tier position statement from a prestigious College of Physicians said, you know what? Low black pain, you should start with spinal manipulation, heat, massage, and acupuncture before you go to meds. They themselves even said you should be doing this for acute and chronic pain, um, low back pain anyway. This is hardly ever done, it, which is sad because even they themselves said you should be doing this. And hydrotherapy could be anything, right? Contrast hydrotherapy when you alternate hot and cold, which always works great because it works as a pump mechanism to move lymph and bring in metabolites and bring in healthy cells to heal. There's electrotherapy, Right, which we talked about, I, I touched on a little bit like e stims, which I'm not a big fan of e stim devices, you know, the ones that people take home and they put on their back because they only work as long as you're using them. But it's maybe temporary pain. Um, you know, when you can use interferential, which is also electric stim, but uh, unlike a TENS unit, which is only palliative pain while the machine is on, things like interferential are uh, more permanent. So, which is nice. And then the way interferential works, if people aren't familiar with those, they're, they're really great for things like joint pain because you have four pads and you basically put them like an X and then the joints in the middle. So as you're doing the different pulses of electricity, it's targeting that joint um, for muscle and lymph. And it does, it works great um, if you have, an ease, if you have a, one of those kind of interferential device in your, in your clinic. What about diet? Right, diet's crucial. And how many times will you hear someone say, well, diet has nothing to do with your pain, which is not true at all. First, right, there's the anti-inflammatory diet, which is essentially a Mediterranean diet. Um, and it's, it's self-explanatory, right? So that would be things that are high in fruits and vegetables, whole food, low in dairy, low in grains, um, high in essential fatty acids from olive oil and sunflower oil, um, and obviously low saturated um, hydrogenated oils and, and healthy saturated fats from things like olive oil. This I love a lot. So this was a study that came out of the prestigious Cleveland Clinic, and they essentially took people who had chronic pain and they just put them on an allergy elimination diet. So the allergy elimination diet is when you move the most commonly inflammatory foods for two to three weeks. In my practice, it works just as well with two weeks and you get more patient adherence. And look at this reduction in pain, right? This pain reduction, it was equal to all of the other ones that I talked about on the previous slide. Pharmacotherapy, surgery, injections, just diet alone was equivalent in pain reduction than all of those um, highly invasive things. So with the average elimination diet, right? So it's no gluten, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's no gluten, no dairy, no corn, no soy, no eggs. Um, and you uh, remove all of those for two weeks. I talked to people about it. And the nice thing about people who have chronic pain is that pain is a big motivator. People are very willing to do whatever you say to get them out of pain. And I'm not talking about people that have LNI and PIP claims that want to just stay on disability. I'm talking about people that, you know, they want their life back. And if diet will do that, they're all they're always willing to. They're like, yep. 
that being said, if you got someone in so much pain and so much comfort and they're so fatigued and they're so anxious, diet isn't the first thing. You got to build them up, strengthen them before you start doing the allergy elimination diet because this is kind of a pain in the butt if anybody's ever done it. So I give them a diet um, diary. I tell them how to do this. I give them a bunch of resources and I'm just like, look, for two weeks, your life is kind of kind of suck. It's just it's a very restricted diet. But nowadays with all the gluten-free meals and you know these things it's just a lot easier gluten-free and casein-free meals and then um, there's books out there there's website and then i say you do that for two weeks and then you're going to introduce your foods one at a time and so i just say if, if gluten is the hardest for you to avoid put that back in first but you have to wait 72 hours between each challenge because there are delayed sensitivities. So for example, if you're gonna eat gluten on a Friday, you, ha you can't do anything for Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And if nothing happens um, in those three days, then Tuesday you challenge the next food. And I tell them you could, it could be anything. You could get a headache, you look for joint pain, worsening pain, change in your mood. Those are all positive responses to an inflammatory food. And remember that there is a difference between a food allergy a food sensitivity and a food intolerance. They're three completely different things. So a true food allergy is a type one IgE mediated hypersensitivity reaction where the person eats, you know, the shellfish and they they get hives or the, their mouth gets itchy. You know, they get angioedema, they get anaphylactic. That's a true food allergy. A food intolerance is not mediated by the immune system. So you, and they're, the symptoms are not uh, outside the gastrointestinal tract. They're relegated to only the GI tract. And that's, you, that's an enzyme problem, typically. So lactose intolerance, right? The most common intolerance in the industrial world, you don't have enough of the enzyme lactase to break down the milk sugar lactose. That's, that's a food intolerance. Food sensitivity is a much more nebulous world that we all live in, um, particularly as holistic healthcare providers, and that it may or may not be mediated by the immune system. And if it is mediated by the immune system, then that's when you might see these extra gastrointestinal effects. So if you do IgG4 or IgG food testing, which I occasionally do, just note that if they're having a food sensitivity that is not mediated by the immune system, you'll get spuriously negative results. So that's why the gold standard is the allergy elimination diet. And then when it comes to things like dairy, I have them challenge dairy in three different ways. I, I'm like cow's milk, if they drink cow's milk, I'm like, you gotta count, you know, challenge cow's milk, wait three days, eat some yogurt, wait three days, and then, you know, eat some cheese, and wait three days. And what you'll see a lot is people won't tolerate cow's milk, but they maybe are fine with cheese or they're fine with dairy. And that's because it's fermented and lower in lactose and casein. Uh, it, and that kind of goes with a lot of these other food sensitivities. But I would say in my clinical experiencing with thousands of patients, yeah, the allergy elimination diet will always work and you'll always be able to find something. That being said, if they're on a bunch of steroid meds, then, um, and they're having breakthrough pain, the allergy elimination diet sometimes is a little I wouldn't say risky. It's just that you may not elucidate as much information as you want because they're on an immune suppressant. So you kind of just talk to the patient and, and, you know, see if maybe they'll do it and it will elucidate one of their flares. If it elicits a flare, then you know, and many of them will know this, like an RA patient may come in and be like, I know I don't do well with gluten, you know, or dairy or soy or whatever it is. So let's talk about what my, one of my favorite medical modalities, um, which is probably, which is homeopathy, the most contentious of all medical modalities that I'm aware of in the world. It's like people, you know, you either love homeopathy, kind of neutral, or you think it's the devil and it's the worst thing ever in the total placebo effect. And I can tell you that it's much more than a placebo effect and it's quite effective. And what's nice about homeopathy, right, is that it treats the patient's physical, mental, and emotional self has no contraindications, it has no interactions, and it's extremely effective. Um, particularly, and we'll go through some case studies at the end, but particularly if someone has um, an autoimmune disease, or really any disease that's causing their chronic pain, when they start to flare, give them their constitutional remedy, and 99 times out of 100, they either won't flare at all, or they'll come back and be like, wow, that flare was like half of what I used to get and only lasted a day versus two weeks. Or they'll say, I used to have to go on prednisone every time I flared. And I just took 400 milligrams of ibuprofen for two days and I was fine. 
So we know that it's working. So this, I'm not great with acute homeopathy. There's constitutional homeopathy, which is the bigger picture treating the whole thing. Acute is more like what people are used to, you know, they bang their leg and they get swollen, you give them arnica. But that being said, people with chronic pain, a lot of times I'll try to reset the cycle of chronic pain and I'll give them arnica 10M, a very, very high potency arnica to try and stop the cycle of chronic pain clear some of those, um, you know, murky waters out and smooth the rough edges, then start my other treatments. But for those that um, are interested in homeopathy, or you might want to implement it in your practice, you're already doing it. This is a fantastic book called Homeopathy for Musculoskeletal Healing. And it's literally homeopathy paint by numbers. So, you know, if you're stuck, or you're like, I'd like to help this person out, it's a, you just whatever kind of pain the person has, you flip to that part of the book and they have usually just like a figure of a human body. And then I'll give that to them and say, read these remedies and which one sounds most like you and your pain picture. And typically they'll read all of them. Like this one's definitely me. Or they'll say, you know, they all of them really match me. I'm like, okay, which one's most like your pain picture. And I give that to them usually as a 30 C and I'll give them, you know, usually five pellets you know, a couple times a day, twice a day for a week, and then have them contact me. Because in homeopathy, if you give them too much homeopathics for too long, then you can actually make things worse. Um, so less is more in the world of homeopathy. And here's, here's some studies talking about homeopathy and pain relief. And even the journal Lancet said, the results of meta-analyses are not compatible with the hypothesis that the clinical effects of homeopathy are just placebo. So even the Lancet saying, there's something to homeopathy, right? A very conservative, very high tier journal. So let's talk about the placebo effect, right? And conventional medicine. And, must, and you can use, we should all use the placebo effect to our advantage, particularly like in people with chronic pain, right? They just having someone hearing them out. It's part of the therapeutic intervention, just listening to them. And they know that someone cares about them, right? That's the placebo effect. But you're already you know, getting them better. Well, here was a great study that came out in 2002 in the New England Journal of Medicine, where they took a bunch of people who had 180 patients who had osteo, mild to moderate osteoarthritis in the knee, and they followed them for two years. So reason 165 people completed the trial, followed them for two years. And what they did was they either gave them a fake a sham surgery, or they gave them real surgery. And the only person who knew which patient got what was the surgeon. So even to the point where um, the participants who were getting the sham surgery, the surgeon, it was the same surgeon, he made an incision in their knee. So if they woke up out of anesthesia, they thought they got the surgery. And the surgical team saw a video of a knee surgery on the TV, and they were just handing this person. So they didn't know if that person was getting real surgery, debridement, or fake surgery. And I don't think this is really standard of care anymore for mild to moderate osteoarthritis, but I still see a bunch of people go through debridement and the, the orthopedic surgeon's just like, well, this is just temporary until you need a knee replacement. But the point of this trial is, look, after 24 months, the individuals who got the fake surgery did better than the people that got the real surgery. They had less pain, they had improved Womax scores, and then they also had the stair test where they make people go up and down stairs who have knee pain. People who didn't get the surgery had improved stair testing, see the walking and climbing stairs. So the moral of this study is, is that don't ever underestimate the placebo effect, right? People that got the fake surgery actually did better than people who got the real surgery. We'll go through this slide and then we'll take a break and I'll answer questions that are coming in. So in, in my world, one of the biggest things we can also do besides homeopathy is are the botanicals. The, the benefit of the botanicals is that they're multimodal. They act on many, many mechanisms at once. They're very safe, typically, and they're very effective. The drawback of the botanicals is they're not steroids. They're not NSAIDs. So you have to give higher doses more frequently to see results in people's pain pictures. The other advantage also is botanicals can have affinities for certain areas of the body. So for me in chronic pain, I actually have my own formula that I have a company called Herbal Vitality make for me in like these big, you know, 
16 ounce bottles, at least when I had a clinic, 32 ounce bottles. And then I dispense two ounces, four ounces, eight ounces to patients. Um, and then they take them because it's hard to get this many pills in, but, and it's easier to take tinctures because you can get way more herb into someone and it's a liquid and they can put it in juice. If they don't like the taste. It's just a lot easier than a whole bunch of pills. Um, Herbal Vitality is great. It's a PhD that owns the company. He makes great tinctures. Um, now that I'm only telehealth, if I have someone who needs these things, I just order it from him and he drop ships it to the patient. So let's go through some of the classes, right? You can use the herbs like drugs, right? We have analgesics and anodynes, and I'm just giving some examples. And right, this Salix Alba, which is what aspirin is made from. People will ask me, well, does white willow have the same contraindication as aspirin? And I would say, theoretically it does. So you wouldn't give it to someone under the age of 16 for worry of rise syndrome. You wouldn't give it to someone who has a salicylic acid, uh, an aspirin allergy, just err on the side of caution. Um, it's not the same as aspirin, but aspirin is derived from it. So, um, and if you look at these studies, right, and the reason some of these doses are really high is because most trials, as we know, they look at a single intervention with usually some kind of disease state, and they look at a set of out and one outcome. Did the person have reduced pain? Did their inflammatory markers go down? But when you use these botanicals together and you get the synergy, you can use a lot lower um, dose than, you know, five grams of turmeric. You won't necessarily need that much because you're using other botanicals. And then this anti-arthritic, anti-inflammatory, everybody knows curcuma longa, but what most people don't know, right, is that um, not all curcumins are created equal, is that it has low bioavailability. So you got to look one that um, is not just 95% curcuminoids, but you need to enhance its absorption. So there is one out there called Curcuin, a number of brands carry it, and it shows a high bioavailability, high absorption, and long plasma half-life. So again, like drugs, I'm pulsing these frequently because I want to keep a steady state of curcuminoids in their blood or um, celicin or boswellic acids. I want that to stay in their blood to keep the pain control because you got to dose it frequently, usually three times a day. Um, and then when people's pain gets better, you can taper it. Uh, you know, different, if I'm trying to get someone who has, you know, nerve pain or dementia, I'm going to use a different type of tumor called long vita. And again, you can find these all over the place. Plus it's food. I have people juice with it. I have them cook with it, put it in their curries, not just pills and tinctures all the time. Try to cook with herbs. And then of course, you know, is one of the most famous. Um, this I don't use in tincture because I used to. If anybody's ever tried this, it's a resinous plant that um, there's no bad taste. It is horrible. And I just got too many patients that were like, I'm not, can't do this anymore. So I took out of that formula and I gave it to them as a pill. And again, you want it standardized to a percent of boswellic acids. It is a resin, low bioavailability. Take it with some fatty meal. Um, you'll enhance absorption. And there are studies um, where they give turmeric and boswellia together in osteoarthritis, and they work better from the synergy effect than one or the other alone. And I can stop here and answer questions. Uh, quite a few questions have been posted in the chat window. If you've got your chat window open, um, I sent many of them to you, copied them and sent them to you privately as well. Okay. If you'd like, uh, I could just ask you. Uh, yeah, why don't you just read them off to me? That'll be fine. Okay. Um, uh, you've got some acronyms, um, HPI and PE. Um, can you define them? Sure. HPI is the history of presenting illness and PE is physical exam. Okay. Excellent. Um, you mentioned uh, circadian pain patterns, or at least looking at uh, pain at different times of the day. Um, do these affect how the pain is treated? Yes, that, that's a good question. So for me, when I ask people if they're like, you know, I'm fine in the morning, but by the end of the day, my pain is just horrible. So then I'm going to ramp up their treatment more in like the late afternoon. So they're not in such chronic pain late at night, or you get the person who has got a lot of pain in the morning. I have them take a whole bunch of stuff before they go to bed. So they don't wake up in pain. Like ankylosing spondylitis, for example, right? It means hallmark symptom is, you know, pain upon waking, slow movement. And, and then as they start moving, their joints kind of loosen up. 
um, then I'll just basically give them a whole bunch of stuff before bed. So timing is crucial. Um, and on that point, another thing that's crucial, I'm glad that someone brought it up because I forgot to mention that in women, I asked them, is your pain better or worse around ovulation? You know, if they're, if they're premenopausal, is your pain better or worse around you know, your period. And it's like, oh yeah, when I get my period, you know, it is horrible. So, you know, there's a hormonal influence to their pain, regardless of what the lab tests show. So one of my interventions and strat strategic interventions is I'm going to optimize their hormonal cycle. So they're in less pain. Uh, how about the TSI acronym for the thyroid test? Okay. Oh, that's that's um sorry that's thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin so that's differentiating people who have graves disease versus hashimotos thyroiditis cuz what'll happen a lot of what happens many times is people of hashimotos they wax and wane between hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism so sometimes they present to the doctor's office while they're hyperthyroid and they get erroneously put on a thyroid blocking medication which like methimazole and then they feel worse. It's because they actually don't have hyperthyroidism. They have Hashimoto's, but they were just in a hyperthyroid state. So if you run those, those antibodies, uh, you'll be able to actually differentiate very clearly whether they have Graves disease or they have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, have you seen a connection between lower back pain and dental problems? I have not. I mean, if it's probably that, that pain may question may be coming from a dentist and, and they may be seeing it more. What I have noticed, and I actually learned this from a chiropractor who taught one of our manipulation classes at Bastyr, and he said he had no evidence for this, just 20 years of practice, that people who had a lot of adrenal dysfunction, you know, insufficiency, not straight adrenal fatigue, because that's like, that's actually Addison's disease, that they had a lot of back problems that his treatments weren't holding. So he just started giving them herbs like adaptogens. And he said, all of a sudden, lo and behold, his, their low back pain was better, which makes sense, right? Your adrenal glands sit right up here around T, T12 L1. And he said the adjustments were holding longer, but the, any association between teeth pain or dental caries and low back pain, I haven't personally seen it. How about um, pain that is specifically, let's say, mycotoxin based or phytotoxin based? That's a that's another good question. I should add that into this slide. Is that um, mycotoxins, right? So mycotoxins are never right on my high list with anybody's condition, health condition, no matter what their disease. But if I'm working with them for a little while and they're not responding to any of my treatments, I'm going to investigate mycotoxins. And one, I'll ask them, do you, do you notice mold around your house? Do you work in a moldy environment? Um, you know, do, and it's not the mold per se, it's the toxin that the mold produces. And some people are susceptible to mycotoxins and some are not. The lab that I use is called My Myco Lab. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Dr. Andrew Campbell. He is a medical doctor. He's probably the world's, one of the world's leading experts in mycotoxin. It's his lab. FDA cleared, CLIA cleared, CLIA waived. It's a blood test and he tests about 12 antibodies to mycotoxins and you get a nice report versus the urine tests. The urine tests are not very useful because mycotoxins are mostly bound to albumin, a protein produced in the liver. And unless someone has severe kidney disease, albumin doesn't get into urine. So a few of them will, but Antibody testing is far more uh, precise measurement of someone's mycotoxin uh, burden or load than it would be from urine. And his test is great. You can have a mobile phlebotomist come to the house and draw it and he processes the lab. Same thing like immunosciences though, they don't accept insurance. You pay them out of pocket. It's like 500 bucks or something. And then you submit that to your insurance for reimbursement or an HSA plan or FSA. How about uh, uh, cannabis and cannabis extracts for pain? Uh, I don't use a whole lot. Well, cannabis, I don't prescribe because it's actually a level one substance in the United States. It doesn't matter whether it's licensed in your state. I live in Washington state. It's recreational use. I think California is as well. Um, it doesn't matter. I'm still not allowed to prescribe it. I could lose my license, but I do use a fair amount of CBD. Um, again, lower on my priority list. 
Um, and the cannabis I avoid a little bit because of the more psychoactive components. I have people that come in and say, you know, medical cannabis helps me with this, whether it's in, you know, eating it or elation or pain, um, you know, topical. So I'm like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But I will use CBD topically and orally more because the psychoactive components have been removed. And we'll go through some of that, like how I do low dose naltrexone. I have some slides on that. Um, are you going to be covering headache, pain, or migraine um, for the second half, or can you cover it now? Uh, I'm not covering it in this PowerPoint, but yeah. Um, so what I do with migraines, chronic headaches, is um, straightforward. It's, I have never not seen a food be a component. I have a number of patients who go through the allergy elimination diet, just the elimination portion, and they have no headaches. And they are like, they're like, I've been headache free for the last two months. I don't even want to challenge any foods. And I say, okay, as long as you're not becoming malnourished because it's a restricted diet, don't challenge foods. So between um, one is the physical assessment to make sure that their spine is in alignment, right? And make sure that there's nothing impinging on a nerve, make sure there's no hypertonicity in their shoulders and their neck. And there's different kinds of headache, right? There's tension headaches, there's migraines, there's, you know, um, cluster headaches. You got to define what kind of headache. And so between physical manipulation, massage, and homeopathic and uh, allergy elimination diet, I can literally count maybe two patients in 10 years who I did not get rid of their headaches 100%. Not, not trying to pat my own back. I'm just saying sometimes they don't respond. When I would practice in Connecticut, the... Um, the Chronic Headache Institute of Hartford Hospital just started sending me all their refractory patients because I just started helping a couple. They go back to their doctor, doctor would send them to me. So between diet, musculoskeletal, um, migraines are a little bit different. And then homeopathy and um, like I said, diet, they're, the headaches totally go away because it's almost always a food. I got an extended question here from Rachel, about uh, chronic pain, um, pregnancy, uh, hip and pelvic pain for months on end. And uh, are there usually multiple contributing factors like inflammation from lipopolysaccharides and or maybe gut or tooth infections? And what tools are you using clinically for physical pain in pregnancy? Yeah, that's a good question because when you get into pregnancy, it's a whole different world, right? I mean, most everything you can't use. So a lot of the botanicals, like for example, can't use turmeric pregnancy because it's an abortive patient. So you got to be cautious with the herbs, know which ones can be used. With me, it's, it's usually the hormone fluctuations, um, like especially in second, third trimester when relaxin really and progesterone climbing, it makes everything kind of loose. So with pain in pregnancy, I usually try low force, so contrast hydrotherapy. They can even do in the shower, right? They got the hot water on, pain is for 30 seconds. Turn it on cool. It doesn't have to be cold, cool for 30 seconds. And you do on and off. It's contrast hydro. You always, and so it's the three threes. And it's hot, 30 is cold in sets of three. So it takes about 10 minutes to do it. You do it a few times a day. Um, heating pads, especially ones that do um, full spin infrared. I'm not a company, but Theris, they make these great infrared, all different sizes. They make wraps that can go around your neck and your back. Those are safe. You just don't put them over these, right? Um, and then usually massage, acupuncture, yoga. In women, that's typically how they manage their pain, a lot of magnesium. But the herbs, there's not a whole lot we use. And, you know, especially because I have a lot of with autoimmune disease and they end up pregnant, depending on the autoimmune disease, 50% get better during pregnancy and 50% get worse. And that's also things that are shown in studies. So it kind of depends. It's, it can be, it can be challenging and just, you know, try to do your best and find out what might help taking walks, stretching, warm, you know, heat, but a lot of the oral stuff can't be used. I'm a huge fan of acupuncture, works really well, very safe, very effective and pregnancy induced pain. How do you treat central sensitization pain? Um, that probably referred to my slide is that um, all the things that we're going to go through here will undo though that pain picture because it gets them in less pain and then the, the central nervous system corrects itself and homeopathy and then they won't be 
hypersensitized to pain within due time. It'll just go away on its own. I got a specific question about how uh, somebody's asking about how binders um, like zeolites work to relieve their pain in their joints. So from what I understand, I don't use a whole lot of zeolite and the de I don't think the data is super strong. It has mostly to do with toxins or, or, or in the gut and toxicants from the environment. So zeolite is basically a sponge. And I've had a number of patients just come in on their own taking it and they report benefit. So my only concern would be, at, I talk to them and say, well, if it's a company I don't know, contact that company and get a certificate of analysis for heavy metals and just make sure that it's not you know, high in heavy metals. And they'll bring it back to me. And I'm like, look how high the lead is. Let's maybe switch to a different zeolite. But from what I understand, yeah, it could be binding LPS, lipopolysaccharides, other toxins, um, which then would subsequently reduce pain. Uh, there's a, also a question about prolotherapy um, that you haven't mentioned. It is that something you're going to be talking about in the second half, or how does that work for muscle joint injuries that don't seem yep. to heal on their own? It'll be in a later slide with prolotherapy and you know neural therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, can you comment on the tens type of machines for chiropractic so and home use? Yeah, so tens devices. Um, they're like these little boxes, right? They have these little electrodes. There's two electrodes. You put them on your shoulder, wherever the pain is, and then you turn the TENS unit on, and it only works as long as the unit is on. It doesn't have long-term pain relief. That's why a lot of times people will um, rent them from the doctor or the, the pain clinic or the chiropractor or the ND um, because the doctor's just trying to help them provide pain relief while they're home while they're still doing stuff in the office. They are not they're, pal they're purely palliative devices, I'm not against them. I just, you know, they're palliative. Uh, where the other uh, e-stim devices are much more permanent. So they're fine enough. You can buy them on Amazon, they're cheap and people will love them. And I have people all the time, they're like, oh man, I could sit for 45 minutes with this thing on. I'm like, well, good, you're out of pain for those 45 minutes. And then 10 minutes later, they're back in pain. So that lets me know then there's other things I need to work on to eradicate their pain more permanently. Um, also, do you use uh, peptides in any of your protocols? No, no. Okay. Well, that's the end of the question. Do you want to start part two? Sure. Thanks for reading those off, Stephen. Um, okay. So hopefully everybody took a nice stretch, had a bathroom break, got some water, some tea. Round two. So again, more on the botanicals. Um, Harpagophytum procumbens, and, and no, th these are all the Latin names of them. I, I'll, I should put it in the common name. This is Devil's Claw, and it, it's hard, right? Because there's Devil's Claw, there's Devil's Club, you know, there, there's a lot of these cat's claw. Devil's Claw, which is this, is great because it does have an affinity for the joints and has affinity for the low back. So if I have people that have joint pain, low back pain, I'm going to use this herb a lot. It's really in my little pain tincture anyway, um, because most people have joint pain, through coming in with chronic pain. And again, fairly high dose when used by itself. Um, Uncaria tomentosa, which is cat's claw. Some of you may be familiar with this because it's used a lot in tick-borne illnesses, particularly Lyme disease, um, because uh, it, you know supposedly you know breaks up biofilms and does. It, it is immune stimulating. Um, there is a different species that's anti-cancer, um, but this one is more for uh, pain. And I used to use it a lot in pain by itself because the, there was so much evidence. I never really saw it do much of anything. So I added it to formulas and it, it seems to work fine, but I'm also, these tinctures I have might have 12 herbs in them, very, very Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine style. But I think that it's gonna be doing something because of the fact that studies show it and the synergy effect that I'm getting, um, the entourage effect, if you will, even though it's mostly in the endocannabinoid system. Then there's in, there's ginger, right? Ginger, a lot of people, they love it, right? They know it for its anti-nausea effects, um, but it's also a very strong anti-inflammatory has studies in chronic migraines for the person who is wondering about migraines. Um, but, and it gets food, juice it, cook with it, eat it, drink the tea. Um, notice that it is a very warming herb, so like turmeric. Um, so if you have a person who is already kind of that wired, tired, and you know, hot-blooded person, 
you know, in the Ayurvedic sense of things, or even Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, this would aggravate pitta, person's um, heating element, or in Chinese medicine, it could aggravate too much um, yang and make them more agitated. So if people say that, I just give them less, but I do love ginger, particularly because a lot of people with chronic pain are nauseous, and also a lot of people um, we're giving, they're taking a lot of pills, or taking a lot of meds, or taking all these tinctures, they can get a little bit of nausea. Ginger can offset that. So you get the best of all worlds. Here is some other things to do. And I, the reason I'm just bundling these together is because th there are studies out there, but for sake of time and the, the cl not cluttering up the slide deck, um, I didn't put any references in here. These are the herbs that I use a lot of, you know, um, and they're in that tincture. So we already mentioned Salix, this is valerian. Most people are aware of valerian for sleep, but valerian also is a nervine. So it's good for nerve pain and calms the central nervous system down. Pisidia is Jamaican dogwood. This is one that is a low to moderate dose herb. You don't wanna give people too much Pisidia. People say, well, how much is too much? I'd have to look up the actual milligrams that they could have. It's, it's, it's not toxic like aconite, it won't kill them. But Pisidia will have some side effects of like dry mouth, a little bit of blurred vision. You know they're getting too much Pisidia. And the tinctures that I use, I already calculated all that out. So if I'm even giving people tablespoon doses, they're not going to get enough Pisidia to harm them. But it's a great um, uh, pain reliever. Piper methysticum is kava. Again, kava got a bad rap, what, probably 15 years ago that a few people in Europe drank bucket loads of it and then they had hepatic failure. Well, if you look at most of those case studies that people that had the liver toxicity, they had pre-existing liver disease. They had cirrhosis, you know, they had whatever they had, they, they had pre-existing liver disease, which made them more likely to not tolerate anything they were taking. So it wasn't kava, kava is very safe. Again, it's a nervine, so it's very calming. Also great for people who have nerve pain. Corydalis is a straight up low dose herb. That's a Chinese herb. This one, again, you I don't think you could kill someone on it, but you if they start getting diplopia, you know, like they get blurred vision, they get double vision, their pupils dilate, um, they get dry mouth, that's way too much Corydalis. You don't need much, it, a little bit goes a long way. And this is nice, instead of giving someone a muscle relaxer, which I'll go through like Flexoril or something, you can actually use the herbs to do it for you. So if someone has a lot of musculoskeletal pain, they're spasming all the time, um, you know, obviously heat always is great and, you know, other topicals and, um, and, and baths and Epsom salt baths and things. But I like adding in these herbs and people know this one is black cohosh and they are familiar with black cohosh for its use in perimenopause, but the original use of this herb by the physiomedicalists back in the 18, late 1800s, early 1900s was for an antispasmodic. It only was used later um, for some of its, it, it's not a phytoestrogen. It, we don't, um, it, 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 it's theorized to work for hot flashes because it's an antispasmodic. Um, great herb. This is yam, this is chamomile, psidia, this is just a different, you've noticed a different species, right? These are both Jamaican dogwood. One is a pain reliever and one is antispasmodic. And viburnum is the species, there's cramp, which is cramp bark that has affinity for the uterus. So if someone is like, you know, I'm in a lot of pain and then when my period happens, it's just really gripping and everything's worse. So my uterus is spasming out. This herb works beautifully to relieve those and they don't even really need any insights. More botanicals. Um, and these aren't in that pain tincture, um, except I think I might've put withani in there. So the ginsengs, ashwagandha, rhodiola, holy basil, licorice. So again, when we, when we look at adaptogens, they're on a spectrum from say really stimulating to more tone, they're all tonifying, but to less stimulating and calming. So if I have that completely depleted person, can't get out of bed, they're cold all the time, yes, they may have hypothyroidism, I'm gonna give them a much more stimulating ginseng like Panax ginseng, which is Asian ginseng. If they're that wire tired, ramped up person who is, you know, it fatigued, but you wouldn't tell because they're just running on catecholamines and adrenaline, I'm going to give them Panax quinquefolias, which is American ginseng, which is much more calming. Um, that being said, if you are going to use American ginseng, make sure that it's either um, ethically 
wild harvested or cultivated because it is it's not endangered it's but it is it's a threatened species due to its popularity in the United States and and other parts of the world in North America and Europe it's being overpicked so you just got to kind of pick your your poisons and what's nice about the adaptogens right they decrease cortisol they help people get calm they help with fatigue studies are showing that the um these family of herbs, the adaptogens, are actually being effective in pain. There was a paper that came out earlier this year showing ashwagandha at 1,000 milligrams a day was alleviating chronic back pain. So these are kind of doing dual purpose for a lot of things. And you can also make them as teas, um, just caution of licorice, right? You don't want to give too much licorice to people because they can get high blood pressure. Um, that's pretty much offset by having them eat extra potassium-rich foods. And again, the nervine. So if I have someone who has a lot of nerve pain, radiculopathy and neuropathies, I'm going to start thinking of the nervines added into the formula. This is California poppy, especially for the people that can't sleep, right? It can make them a little sleepy. So I'm going to give them this at bedtime. Same with chamomile, lemon balm, and then a vena sativa is oats. So you can see I'm kind of, what kind of pain did the person have? What's the etiology of the pain? I'm going to pick herbs and you know, the homeopathy um, to match all of those things. And then we'll just talk about immunomodulators because a lot of times people on chronic pain, they do have an autoimmune disease. And so they're on immune suppressants or maybe they don't have an autoimmune disease and they're just on a whole bunch of prednisone. So they are not able to handle those medications at therapeutic doses because they're always sick. And especially now with COVID you know, and everything else and cold and flu season. So. I use these, there are immune stimulants, which are a relative contraindication, right? With someone with an autoimmune disease, they're like, oh, if you give someone with autoimmune disease an immune stimulant, and they're on, and especially if they're on immune suppressant, they're, you're gonna worsen their autoimmune disease. Number one, that's theoretical. It's, it's, it's not necessarily ever really seen. There might be some random case reports, but I don't wanna cause someone to go in a flare. So what I do with immune stimulants and even immune modulators with people that have autoimmune disease, whether or not they're on an immune suppressant, I pulse them. So I might say, take these mushrooms or take this Monday through Friday and don't take it on Saturday and Sunday. Or I might say, you know, take it for three weeks on, one week off. And I can tell you in thousands and thousands of patients over the last 10 years, I've never seen anybody have any problems with when they, when they take these things. Someone did ask about peptides. Um, you know, phospholipids do have pop, from milk. Phospholipid colostrum does have you know immunoglobulins and other peptides. Um, I do use that for people who um, they're always getting sick. And I you know, I'll, I'll say, let's get you on some mushrooms for a while, both edible and in a supplement. Right, reishi's not um, an edible mushroom. You know, cordyceps. You would not eat this. It grows on the back of a caterpillar. Um, now they grow. They cultivate it. But things like fucoidins from brown seaweed, zinc, vitamin A, they're all very immune modulatory. And you know, I have a whole different presentation on autoimmune disease and how to basically send people into remission, but using these to induce immune tolerance. So I'll run through these, you know, just because um, it's, it's a, lot, a lot of you know, um, nutrients, it's a lot of ingredients, it's a lot of dosing, um, but I think people should know about them and their ability to be utilized in chronic pain. So the B vitamins, especially thiamine, paradoxine, and methylcobalamin or adenosine, any of the cobalamins, you know, not cyano, that, that stuff's garbage. So with this, this has been shown to people with these two, people with nerve pain and anybody who has nerve pain or tries to treat nerve pain, nerve pain can be very difficult to treat, right? It's hard to treat nerve pain. It's hard to get ahead of it, but you also got to find, do they have a mechanical compression? Do they have a herniated disc? Do they have diabetes? What is causing their nerve pain instead of just reflexively giving them, you know, something like gabapentin? Um, vitamin E is, a lot of people know because it's the antioxidant, it's ability to help with heart health, but it's great for reducing neuropathic pain. And remember with vitamin E, it's a family of nutrients. So there's four tocopherols and four tocotrienols. Most people are just familiar with alpha tocopherol. So what you got to do is give it the, fa the family of them, usually high gamma E. And there's a number of supplements out there. Um, you know, Jaro makes one that's called full spectrum E. I have no affiliation with that company, but that's a, that's a good one to use um, 
Allergy Research Group, I am affiliated with them. I don't receive royalties on sales. They have a couple tocotrienol ones with some tocopherols that are nice. Um, but if someone's got severe pain, is this all of a sudden going to get rid of it? No, but it's something you can add on to enhance the other therapies. You know, they're on gabapentin, give them this, and then they can go down on it. Um, there's other case studies, right? Like I had one time when I was, I was actually a first year resident. There's an older gentleman that came in whose son, whose, whose daughter brought him in, the daughter and the, the husband brought the dad in. And they, he had a bunch of uh, radiculopathy running down his hand and his internist gave him gabapentin, but to the point where it was working, the, the, the dad was basically sleepy all the time and in a state of stupor. That's why they brought him in to see, um, not me per se, he just got assigned to my shift when I was a resident and I was the attending for that shift. And so I was like, well, I don't know. I mean, one of the first signs of nerve pain, particularly in the elderly, is B12 deficiency. We went ahead and tested his B12. He came back the following week. It came back super low. So all we did was we gave him um, a couple of injections of 1,000 micrograms of methylcobalamin and in for once a week, for four weeks, and in between the injections, we had him do a B12 folate lozenge. Within a month, he had absolutely no neuropathic pain. We tapered him off the gabapentin, and he was fine. This poor gentleman, you know, if the internist had just checked him for B12, and seen that it was low and given him B12, he never would have been on gabapentin. He was sleeping all the time. He was just, even in the exam room, he could like barely answer any questions. And then I'm like, well, does he have dementia? What's going on here? And then he was totally fine. That's obviously a slam dunk case, but it's just, sometimes it's a no brainer. And then vitamin D obviously being very important. Um, I'm not gonna go hell, I except for the fact that the sixth moment would be, I see way too many people both the general public and then there's prescribe way too much vitamin D. So the, it's toxic for the person. It's not acutely toxic, but they're they're like, oh, you have an autoimmune disease. You need uh, 90 nanograms you, you know, per mil in your blood or 100. There is evidence showing that that is any better than giving 140 when in fact the reverse evidence is true. Someone at eight Nanogram, nanograms per milliliter or high over time, they're more likely to end up with kidney stones, bladder stones, and hardening of their arteries. Humans natural shut off mechanism vitamin D. So the only way to get someone at these 50, 60, 70 levels is exogenous use. Humans don't make that much vitamin D. There are studies where they put lifeguards out in the sun in Hawaii for 45 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, and then, and then put sunscreen on them. And they monitor them for three months, four months, five, and they their blood levels. And these lifeguards never get above 30, 40. So the optimal range of what really is anti-inflammatory and has all these other lovely aspects is you know, uh, between 30 and 40. I would actually even lower this now to 30 to 40 nanograms per mil. But it is, I'm not saying don't use vitamin D, there's just no reason to be blasting people indefinitely with copious vitamin D. And it really should be balanced with the other fat solubles, A, K2, and E. But you do need it. It helps your body absorb magnesium, it helps your body absorb calcium, but you don't need it above that. It's not even safe. And there's no evidence showing that it actually infers any benefit. The, mineral, the minerals. Right, a lot of people know boron maybe a little bit for its use in um, hormonal production, particularly testosterone and estrogen, some of the androgens. It's also got some evidence for bone building. And, but in these higher doses, around six milligrams, which is a fairly large amount of boron, it's got a, quite a bit of evidence for its use in joint pain with the ed underlying etiology of osteoarthritis. So I do like to kind of use it in formulas. Of course, cow mag, when people come in in chronic pain, one of the first things I do with them, um, I mean, I usually get them a homeopathic and then we talk about diet, you know, I'm trying to find out what's going on, is I give them a calcium, magnesium, potassium supplement that's a powder to try to get the muscle relaxing and central nervous system relaxant out of this. So it's a powder I use from a company called Professional Formulas. Um, and I, I don't have any affiliation with them, but they make this nice mixed berry flavored powder because it's hard to get this much into someone that's um, in pills. And I just have them take 
two teaspoons in the morning and two teaspoons before they go to bed. And, you know, and then the adequate D and then I start tapering them. But a lot of people say, oh, I just slept so much better and my muscles relaxed a little bit. I really do like using um, it in powdered form. And, and the, the potassium is a muscle relaxant and it calms the central nervous system. Because remember, you need calcium and magnesium for muscles to contract and relax. These are for nerve pain, just like the B vitamins and um, the vitamin E. Drawback of acetylcarnitine is that it's expensive, but it's effective. And typically with people who come in that have diabetic neuropathies or you know something like that, I usually give them 1500 milligrams twice a day before bed and upon waking. Some people, um, it stimulates their brain to kick on because that's why it's useful in dementia and other cognitive disorders. So I'm like, if you can't sleep because of the carnitine, take it in the middle of the day. Um, but you got to get a lot into them. And in, it, since it's an amino acid, it's better away from protein. So I usually have people take it on empty stomach um, or they can take it with carbohydrates because so you don't have to worry about any inhibition. But it's neuromodulatory, has protein and gene expression, helps with nerve growth factor. This stuff's amazing. But you got to get a lot into someone. And one of the complaints that people have is that it's, it's expensive, and it is. Um, this is another amino acid um, for nerve pain. Um, chronic pain. I usually add uh, this in, I usually have like my, my uh, product of choice at, if it's not going to be a tincture. And after two months, if I'm not giving enough pain control and I'm doing all these other things, I'm going to add in something like DNL phenylalanine. You can use for nerve pain and other um, chronic pain. Here was a great study showing for intractable pain, its efficacy. So the omegas, people know these, right, for a lot of reasons, you know, it's anti-inflammatory. I'm not going to go through um, and bore you with its actual mechanism of action. But what I will say is that to get pain under control, you got with omega-3s, for example, you have to use way more um, amounts than you are accustomed to or used to. Even in traumatic brain injuries, they're showing people need 20 grams a day. The only way to really get this amount into someone is in a liquid, is a very concentrated liquid. And to help avoid gastrointestinal upset, I have people like week one, take a teaspoon a day. Week two, take two teaspoons and three. And then up to the point where they're taking like a tablespoon twice a day, watch for easy bruising or bleeding with that much because this will thin their blood at, at 10 grams, 15 grams. And it's one of those things, get the pain under control and then start tapering. Um, to a more like a gram or two grams a day. That being said is that, you know, and I also do this in like every six months, I will change what I'm doing as far as their essential fatty acids. Cause I don't want the same thing all the time. The body doesn't like redundancy for, for too long. It's like, well, I've seen this. So I'm going to switch them to different fish oil companies, different products. These other two, which people may not be as familiar with, um, the omega-6 gamma linolenic acid, that comes from things like borage oil, evening primrose oil. Uh, and people, when they hear omega-6, they immediately think, oh gosh, omega-6, that's pro-inflammatory, you're gonna get a bunch of arachidonic acid and you're gonna die. Well, they're, they're not all omega-6s are creatable, right? And you do need some arachidonic acid. It's just when it goes into too much overproduction, you've got a chronic pain. So I usually will give this by itself. I give these three together from Nordic Naturals. Uh, I have no affiliation with them. They have a product called Pro EFA 369. And then, yeah, I have people taking a tablespoon twice a day, ultimately. Oleic acid and um, avocado and, uh, and, uh, um, oils. So have people, you know, cook with them, low heat, salad dressings, try to get as much in, but you can get much better. You can see it's inhibiting these inflammatory cytokines. That's why they're important. It's not just, well, let's just take some fish oil and then hope it works. But I, people come in all the time. They're like, well, I take 500 milligrams a day. The other thing is, is that if your patient comes in or even yourself on the, it's, I don't like when companies do this. It's misleading. The bottle will say, thousand milligrams you know per soft gel but you turn to the back it's a thousand milligrams of fish oil it's not a thousand milligrams of the active ingredient the you know the epa and the dha so look, look at those cautiously i have people come in all the time they're like i'm taking like six grams a day 
I look at it, I'm like, yeah, but you're really only getting 500 milligrams of essential fatty acids. So I switch them to stuff I like to use and it's much more effective. Here's some other ones like methylphenol methane, people know that as MSM. Um, you know, it, it's, it's evidence is better when used in formulas. It's really good for osteoarthritis and some other pain. Uh, I don't usually ever get people to these six grams. I use it in a formula with maybe 1,500, 2,000, works well. Some people who are sulfur sensitive, just, you know, the, just warn them about it. They might get, you know, stinky toots or um, they get a little bit of flare. Some of them get little, little hivy, a little urticaria with it, but most people tolerate it just fine. It's more of a nocebo effect if they're like, well, I can't have anything with sulfur. It's like, well, you wouldn't be alive. I mean, sulfur isn't just about everything. Glutathione, and these are, I'm not giving an, when I'm going through all these, I'm just letting you know, you kind of pick and choose what works for you, what you like. I may go through something for a while. If I'm not getting enough momentum for that, I might keep them on that, add something in. I'm not just blasting people with all these at once. Glutathione, whether it's going to be an IV or orally, I, um, I like the acetyl glutathione. Um, it, it, Dable and regular glutathione has good data and bioavailability. Uh, I usually have people take this right before bed. I might have them take 2,000 milligrams. And the reason I want them to take it before bed is because when you sleep, that's when you're producing a lot of your endorphins. That's when you're also producing a lot of your growth factor, your body's insulin-like growth factor. Your body's going into repair mode. I want to help those pathways along by giving them the body's most abund abundant intracellular um, antioxidant, which is glutathione. And it works really quite well. I've seen it work really well for people with chronic pain. And also because they're on so many meds, they need the, the glutathione support for their liver and all their other detoxifications. Uh, this is another thing for nerve pain. Um, the studies mostly were in diabetics. A lot of the studies are on IV. Uh, I see it work just as well um, in oral. What I would say, it, it's better away from food but it can make people a little nauseous. So I have them usually take it like 30 minutes before a meal. And it is a hypoglycemic. So let people know that, you know, if they take it, they need to eat within about 30 minutes because they, at, at this high of a dose at 600 milligrams, 300 milligrams twice a day, they might feel a little hypoglycemic, right? A little shaky, a little nauseous. So I just, on the treatment plan, I'm like, set your timer, 20 minutes for a meal, 30 minutes. Some people, they're just like, I just keep forgetting. Then I'm like, fine, take it with food. You lose about 10 to 20% absorption with food, but it still works. We'll get into some other more obscure ones that people aren't as familiar with. So one of these would be agmatine sulfate. And if you read the trials on nerve pain, radiculopathy, it what no one was really seeing any results until this higher end. But maintenance doses, you can go on to this um, lower dose. And you can just, you know, there's a couple companies that have high quality agmatine sulfate out there. One is called Agmaset, and you can find it. Um, I actually know the PhD that created it, and he's got a patent on the, the molecule. But this stuff works really well. It's expensive, but usually people come in and they got a bunch of neuropathic pain. I, again, neuropathic pain's hard to treat. I might give them this, an alpha lipoic acid and some vitamin E, get their pain under control. Also, you know, looking at blood tests, do they need vitamin B12? You know, do they have a, some type of mechanical problem that was compressing on a nerve causing the radiculopathy? Because if it's a mechanical problem, mechanical problems need mechanical fixes. Someone has, you know, a herniated disc, giving them something like this or the B vitamins is, all, is not gonna help that much, right? They need that herniation portion of their disc to go back into place so it's not pushing on that nerve root. So I'm not going to get them a whole bunch of supplements. I'll put them on a traction machine or something. And then lipid replacement therapy is essentially using nothing more than um, lecithin at very, very high doses, like 6,000 milligrams a day. And it can help with people. What I've seen it work well with is people who have infectious causes to their pain. And one of the theories is that you're, you're repairing the cell membranes, you're repairing the mitochondria and then makes the mitochondria be able to produce more ATP so the body can start fixing itself. Um, and I, I, I think it works pretty well. I would say it doesn't work all that well by itself. Another bonus is that people's energy improves because they're producing more ATP. 
Then let's go on to hormones. As you remember, I was kind of going through the therapeutic order and I'm like, okay, I tested their estrogen, their progesterone, their testosterone, their pregnenolone. Do I actually need to use these? And what you'll see over and over and over and what I've seen over and over, people, even if they're younger, 20s, 30s, who are in chronic pain tend to have low androgen, low steroid hormones. And probably part of that is what's theorized to be called the pregnenolone steal, or they sometimes they call it the cortisol steal, where you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. The adrenal glands are spending so much time shunting to make this steroid hormone that these upstream will go down. And that makes obviously common sense. That, that makes sense to me physiologically. The other thing I see is if you notice, all of these steroid hormones are made from cholesterol. So I'm not anti-statin, but you see these people that are just blasted with statins. I'm, not, I'm anti-statin when it shouldn't be used. I'm pro-statin when it should be used, what the studies show it to be working effectively. And people who have um, diabetes or had an adverse cardiovascular event, but their cholesterol gets driven into the ground. They can't produce as much of these hormones anymore because they don't have enough cholesterol to make it. So I routinely will give pregnenolone DHEA um, and we'll go through that because before I give testosterone and before I give these other ones to help get pain under control. Because remember, they're natural steroids. So let's talk about these tough cases, right? I'm like, well, I've done this, I've done that. They've seen this person and they're 50% better or they're still they're 80% better, but they're still having breakthrough pain. They're still flaring, um, which again, usually goes away with the homeopathics anyway. So I'm going to start going into hormone land and I'm going to give men um, anywhere between 20 and 50 milligrams of DHEA with breakfast. And uh, I usually end up giving 25 unless their DHEA is just really low and I need to get them feeling better quickly. I'll give them 50. DHEA has relatively low absorption. So you've got to look for a company that has, it's micronized. So it's in a small and then put into a fatty matrix so it gets absorbed in the lymph and avoids the first pass effect of the liver. Same thing with pregnenolone. So the two I use is from Allergy Research Group. Again, I am familiar, I am affiliated with them, but no royalties on sales, anything like that. Um, but people always wanna know what I'm using. This is what I use. And then for DHEA sulfate, I'm measuring whatever lab you're using, they will usually give you a range and that should be based upon age and gender. So I always like it to be like in the upper middle for men and women. Women, I don't use DHEA anymore because I just was seeing too many side effects because DHEA does preferentially metabolize in a testosterone. And I was getting women that were becoming masculinized. They were aggressive, you know, they were getting chin hair, they were getting back knee. They weren't happy with me. So about five years ago, I just stopped using DHEA and went to this metabolite of DHEA, a number of companies carry it, um, that even in very high doses, isn't metabolized into testosterone. It works as well as DHEA, albeit a little slower, but it still works. And I have women take 100 milligrams in the morning and 100 milligrams in the afternoon. Some people get a little ampy on it with that afternoon dose. So I'd say if it interrupts your sleep or makes you ampy, just take it with breakfast. And then um, sometimes I'll have them take both 200 milligrams of breakfast. So you just watch your patients, see how they respond. And then when they get to the optimal range on blood tests and I'm testing them every three to six months, I don't abruptly stop hormones. I, people don't do well, right? Your body's exogenously getting a hormone. You take it away, it freaks out. So I just taper people off of these. Sometimes they have to get left on really low doses like 10 milligrams or you know the five milligrams of of these, um, of these two, you, you can't do that with these. Some, I think there's a company that makes a 25 milligram, but um, because they're still on medications, we haven't got them off them or they're a little older and they're not producing as much, uh, but it's not that common. Some people say, they call me up three months later and be like, ever since I stopped pregnant alone, a lot of my, some of my pains come back. I'm like, all right, you know, let's go back on 10 milligrams. See how you do. And you won't, you know, ever harm anybody. Contraindication in hormone sensitive cancers or a history of hormone sensitive cancer, right? Someone has an ER positive or progesterone receptor positive cancer. You don't want to give them these hormones. It's, it's too risky. You don't want to be the doctor that has someone's cancer return and they've been in remission for 10 years. And then same thing with these, you know, I'm not going to go into any great detail of how we dose. I rarely, hardly ever prescribe estrogen and progesterone. Just don't need to 
pregnenolone does it. I like pregnenolone bedtime because um, it's a precursor of progesterone. And so it doesn't have overly soporific effects, but it will make people nice and calm and helps them sleep better. 5% of the time, people will say they get nightmares and they don't go away. Switch them to the morning, they're fine. I can't recall anybody who I ever did not, did, did not tolerate pregnenolone. Um, so these are the pharmaceuticals I personally like to prescribe. And um, again, these are for tough cases. I gotta break the cycle of pain. I need to use these short term so I can get them better, get them sleeping. Um, I will, I'm very comfortable doing very high doses, short term of prednisone you know, like 50 milligrams a day for three days and then 40, 30, I've got to get them out of pain. Um, this, these are muscle relaxers, all three of these, and they're individual. Some people respond really well, some don't, some people's insurance covers them well. I also don't prescribe very many because I don't want them to get addicted or dependent on them. And so I might give them, you know, 15 pills, 30 pills, and no refills. You know, I don't want them just being like, oh, this is great. Plus I do assess them for their, uh, their, the propensity to be addicted. I'm like, are you, do you have an addiction problem? I'll, I'll straight up ask them. Do you have a, are you a type of person who gets addicted to things easily? Have you had a problem in the past? Um, you know, they may lie to you, but you can usually tell, right? Um, if you've been practicing long enough, who really just wants the pain script. And also for me, I'm at the advantage of being an ND. Most ND people aren't coming to me because they know they're going to get these kind of scripts. They're going into pain clinics to try to get them, or they end up in emergency rooms, different ones. So anyway, this is Soma. This is Scalaxin. Um, this is my first choice, cyclobenzaprine, which is also called Flexeril. The advantage is that it's a very long-acting muscle relaxer. The disadvantage is it's a really long acting muscle relaxer. So, so people can feel doped up. They can be really tired the next day. I like this a lot for people that can't sleep because of the pain. So I'll give them five milligrams before bed or 10 milligrams. If they're really doped up the next day, I just tell them to keep with it for a few days. Their body acclimates. Um, but again, I'm never usually using this for more than a month, a couple weeks. And then I just kind of go through it. If they just do not tolerate it at all, I'm going to use one of these other ones. Um, and it also depends on what, the, what their insurance coverage is like. Scalaxin, which is metaxalone, can, can be really expensive. I don't know why insurance is balk on it sometimes. And tizanidine is like an anti-nausea, but it also um, an anti-people uh, that, it, but it, it makes people sleepy, helps with um, their muscle relaxation. The problem is it can make people dizzy. Um, and I hear that a lot from people and some people, you know, do well and some people don't. This is my favorite um, prescription topical. I'm a big fan of topicals, the lotions, the potions, you know, the topical CBD, the topical menthols, the patches. Um, you know, I like to go usually low force and give people like salon pos that you can go to any, you know, pharmacy and get. And and those patches are nice because they are supposed to be on for like eight to 12 hours. If those aren't working enough, um, I will prescribe diclofenac, which is an NSAID, horrible NSAID internally. People get ulcers, they get heart attacks. I don't know if you can prescribe it orally anymore, but it's a fantastic topical. And they come in these big patches so people can cut them to the size of their pain. They put them on there, very, very low systemic absorption, if any, so it's very safe and very effective. And that's nice to get, again, you got to break the cycle of pain. And then I use these different anti-nauseas like plocarparazine. And that's usually if people are nauseous from the pain and or nauseous because they're taking so much stuff. I'm like, like, and my homeopathic anti-nauseas aren't working. The, the anti-nausea teas aren't, you know, herbs aren't working and the tea or the deglycerides and rickers root. I need to up the ante. So usually with these, it's like people have been seeing me for four or five months. I'm like, all right, I, I, I need to switch gears and start bringing some meds on board. Kind of already had my spiel about end states, and I like to use them lower dose, short term, if I need them. The way they were invented to be made, not just leave people on, you know, um, you know, naproxen forever, and or you know, when they wonder why they have end up with an ulcer. I do prescribe a fair amount of low dose naltrexone for people where we're just not getting enough pain control, especially if they have an autoimmune disease. You know, they've got MS, they got it, you know, whatever they have, or rheumatoid arthritis. I will use low dose nal naltrexone. And you do want to give it at night um, because it increases endorphins. 
many people will get very bizarre dreams or nightmares. This has to be by a compounded pharmacy. I like it as a liquid so I can titrate it easier. If it's a capsule, what are you going to do? I usually start them at two milligrams. Um, the nightmares go away within about a week. Um, some people don't report nightmares. Many do. They're just really bizarre dreams. If they don't go away after a month, you can give it to them in the morning. And I just basically, every month, I increase it by half a milligram until the person's tolerated it. So if they're taking three milligrams and their pain is well controlled, I'm not going to keep upping it to four and a half. If after three months, they don't notice any improvement, they're not, it's not going to work, even if you got four and a half milligrams on board. So I just tell them to stop it. The caveat is if they're on some kind of opiate or narcotic, they can't take naltrexone because that, that's what blocks their medication from working. And there's lots and lots of studies of low-dose naltrexone um, for chronic pain, for autoimmune disease. The stuff does work very well. It's not curative. That's the thing. It's, so it, they basically have to stay on it forever. So I might just do it to bide my time while I have people on it. And then maybe six months, eight months, I'm like, okay, let's, let's try weaning you off. Let's see how you feel. And then here, of course, is the phytocannabinoids. And um, everybody's like, CBD, CBD. You know, the body has lots of cannabinoid receptors. And in nature, it's not just CBD. There's CBC, CBG, CBA. And then we, we're just now discovering what some of these do. We just scratched the surface. So when I give people CBD orally, I want a full spectrum CBD that's standardized you know, I should say a full spectrum phytocannabinoid. Of course, it needs to be standardized to something, so I know how to dose it. But I want all the cannabinoids in there. I don't want to be reductionist and just be like, I'm just going to give you CBD. It doesn't work as well. And its mechanism depends on the receptor target. And you can see these massive doses. Um, those were in usually anxiety trials, and they were short term. Most of my patients, I usually start them with, say, like 10 milligrams. Again, it's not well absorbed, so you got to put it in some kind of fat and as well as eat it with a fatty meal. And I actually like to combine this with um, omega-3 fatty acids because then you can activate the endocannabinoid system and the CBD works better at lower doses. It's the entourage effect. So I usually give people like 10 milligrams with breakfast and 10 at bed. And then I have them take it for a month, six weeks and see how they do. And I would say, depending on their pain level, they'll end up anywhere between 10 and 40 milligrams a day. I have an MS patient where um, when she flares, or she starts to flare, we bump it to 80, 40 twice a day, and then she goes back down to 40, and that's like her maintenance dose. And then here are some things to do when people aren't responding. Um, you know, you got all these other things you can try. We talked about acetaminophen, cleaning up people's gut. I've had lots of people come in with these bizarre pain pictures, and it turns out they have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And then you we eradicate that, rebuild their gut, pain goes away. Um, but so especially if they've been on all these you know, uh, medications for over time, consider SIBO, even if it doesn't present like see the classic SIBO where they've got a lot of diarrhea, weight loss, a lot of gas and bloating, or there is constipation predominant SIBO, test them anyway. And um, th I prefer the three hour uh, lactulose test where they drink the solution and then they have to breathe into the tube to measure. And you need to measure methane and hydrogen. You have to measure both gases. You can't measure just one. And it needs to be three hours so you can pick up SIBO um, throughout the small intestinal tract. Because sometimes the two-hour tests only get the upper and middle, not the lower small intestine. So, um, and then I talked about topicals. I love topicals. I like the low force ones that you can get first. And then I kind of go to the, um, the pharmaceutical ones later. This no evidence for. I just learned it in a cell salt class. I like the company Highlands. You can buy them anywhere. You can buy them at CVS. For nerve pain, these two together, again, I have no idea how they work. I was just taught this. It's just cell salt's been around for like 150 years. I've had AIDS patients, HIV patients who have, you know, neuropathies from their meds because they were like some of the original people on some of the old school, like, um, you know, uh, medications, antiretrovirals. And this is nice because um, and I, Highlands is the only one that seems to work. I've had other companies, but these work the best. And they're in little, you know, tablets that dissolve easily. I say, take one cap full of each, pour that into your, your water bottle and drink that twice a day. So they're taking four capfuls total. And 
I can't tell you how many times I've had people come back and be like, I don't know what was it, you're these little things I put in my water, but my nerve pain is like 80% better. Um, and I don't know how it works, it just does. It has affinity for the nerves, I guess. And then of course, you know, big into psychotherapy, CBT, hypnotherapy, emotional freedom technique, because that sometimes is the missing piece to people is they just, they need some psychological support. I have a few patients that were that are floxed Right? These are people who took ciprofloxacin or some kind of fluoroquinolone, and now they have all these crazy pain pictures. And I do send them to a therapist to help undo some of these pain pictures, and then I'm doing all my things, and I think they do better. Proteolytic enzymes, uh, I love these things. Right, You don't want to take them with food because then they're just digestive enzymes. The only one I've ever seen where I can get enough into people where they don't get nauseous is from a company called Biotics Research. And they make a product called Intenzyme Forte, and particularly people with autoimmune disease. And um, I usually give them four twice a day, you know, before meals, about 30 minutes before meals. And a lot of people, I've had people with this and some other treatments get off all of their meds and they do really well and they just stay on them and, you know, indefinitely, essentially. Then we talked about, um, someone wanted to know about, we talked about mitochondrial dysfunction and that's more in infectious cause or mycotoxins or toxicants like heavy metals, they interrupt uh, mitochondrial function. I don't do these because I'm not, I'm not training them. I've had doctors in my practice, associates that did them and I would refer out. I referred to sports medicine clinics. I think these are great. Um, the, the drawback is that they're not covered by insurance and they're expensive because you usually have to get a whole series of them. But if I have someone who has a bunch of knee pain and the x-ray shows they have a bunch of degeneration, but they're not at the point where they need a knee replacement, you know, joints are relatively avascular. It takes a long time to get stuff in there when I can send them to someone who does prolotherapy or PRP and they can inject hyaluronic acid. They can get those joints regenerated quicker. So I do like them for that. Um, if it's chronic widespread pain, right, this isn't going to work all that well. And I usually just send it to people I know and I trust that have training and certification in this, like the doctors used to be in my clinic. And I just say, call over there, you know, kind of you need to talk to them about costs, you know, because I know that these can be thousands and thousands of dollars out of pocket. But I do like them, but only by people who know what they're doing. I've seen people who don't know what they're doing and really mess people up. Fortunately, I was never one who referred them. They would come into me like, oh, I saw this, you know, quack that did all these things and now I'm worse. So um, we can end this, you know, kind of the take home message is that, you know, totally cause them, treat the cause, find the triggers because these are people that will flare, you know, and you got to find what those triggers are to the flares, remove those to get the pain under control. Multifaceted, multi-targeted, multi-team, multi-mechanism approach works the best. You got to get, you can't do everything yourself. You'd be very systematic and triage. You know, sometimes you gotta stop the gorilla. Sometimes, you know, you're like, all right, I'm putting the brakes on this. I'm giving you 50 milligrams of prednisone for three days, 40 for three, 30 for three, and then taper them down to zero. I got it. You gotta stop it. Don't be afraid to bring in collateral help. A lot of doctors think they're gonna lose their patient or someone's gonna steal them, and they don't they don't want to refer. And I think that's actually one, you're doing your patient a disservice and it's medical negligence, but that person is going to be so happy that you sent them to someone to help while you, maybe you're managing their diabetes. They're going to tell all their friends and family that, you know, what you did to help them and how you weren't afraid to bring on someone who knew what they were doing. And then of course, of course, giving the right amount of um, medicines, you know, giving someone 500 milligrams of turmeric who has severe rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis is not going to cut it. And here are some case studies, but um, if we have time, I can go through them. I, there might be a lot of questions that I'll answer for the next 15 minutes or so. And then if there's more time, I'll, I'll do some cases. Okay, so if you've got a cell phone, um, please unmute yourself uh, to ask a question. And if you are joining the group by um, the internet, um, please raise your hand or unmute yourself and you'll come up to the top of the screen. and. Let me encourage everybody to ask questions in, per, uh, in person. Uh, Muriel. Yeah, so um, synergy. I actually have two questions. So about synergies. So in general, um, 
a lot of herbs have multiple components as opposed to prescription meds, which typically just have one component. Um, so I'm supposing that um, when you're prescribing herbs, you're kind of um, thinking about that whole complement of um, components in the herb. Yep, that, that's correct. So and you're right is that most medications are single mechanism, right? Or a lot of times we don't even know what the mechanism is. Just look up a drug. It'll say mechanism of action unknown, you know, or it'll say, you know, postulated this is how we think it's working. So what, that's why I like herbs is because they can do many, many things like look at an adaptogen, helps with stress, helps with um, you know, decreased cortisol, helps with sleep, helps with pain. So when I am seeing someone, I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to give some herbs that cover the nerves, the muscles, the pain, you know, and that's usually how I'm doing it. And also to enhance the efficacy of their NSAID or whatever they're on, so I can get them on a lower dose. So they're not having so many side effects from, you know, their TNF blocker or their methotrexate or things like that. And hopefully we can work with um, the specialist to get them off, which more often than not, that's what happens. We get them off of their meds ultimately. Um, and my second question is, can you talk about the um, tapering process, um, how you go about that um, minimal relapsing, and how do you know what they need on an ongoing basis? So yeah, that, that's with patients like this, it's a lot of communication. Like when I have complex cases, I, and maybe I'm telling them to see me in three months, follow like a follow-up visit. I don't want to wait three months. I'm like, send me an email if anything comes up or if we have to triage. Cause what many sometimes will do is they'll come back in three months and say, I was great for six weeks. And then I relapse. And now we, we got to start all over again. I got to undo the things. So I only taper meds in, in two fashions, really two circumstances. One, if like, if I was, if I was the person to prescribe it, then I'm going to be the one tapering because that's my responsibility. Um, and I'm not talking just about prescription meds, but about everything. Oh, right. And so with anything, the meds are more tricky, right? You got to taper them. If it's another doctor that prescribed that, then I talk to them. They have to go back to their doctor to talk about tapering and I'll help them along the way. I have a lot of patients that say, you know what? I've been on 10 milligrams of prednisone for 15 years. I just cannot get off it. Every time I go below, my RA gets worse or my ankylosing spiralis gets worse. So what I do is I'm like, okay, what, either with the homeopathy or the botanicals or the and or the hormones, depending on the case, as they start to taper that prednisone or their drug, then I add those things in and I kind of get a higher dose and I do it by subjection. So if they're in more pain, I'm going to give them more, more of the stuff. And then once they're off of the meds, then we talk about tapering the pregnenolone. And that's usually like, pretty variable, but usually if they're, say they're on hundred milligrams and their blood tests are now normalized, I'm like, and they're, these tablets you can break in half. I'll just say, all right, for the next two weeks, take 50 milligrams. Then after that, take 25 for two weeks and then stop and see how you feel. Usually just like whatever's in the bottle left. So the herbs are the same way. I, I those unlike drugs, you, you don't have, you don't have to worry about abruptly stopping. There's not much rebound. I just slowly take them down or the fish oil, the same thing. They were at a tablespoon twice a day. Every week I'll decrease by like a teaspoon. And I want them to communicate with me. If the pain starts returning, you need to contact me so I can figure it out. Cause sometimes what they'll do is they, especially this time of year, they may go to like a dinner party and they got cross contaminated by some, one of their food triggers or they just didn't care. And they're like, you know what, I'm just eating this cupcake. You know, it's been six months. I don't care. And then I'm like, then they'll come back and be like, oh man, I ate this cupcake and my hands swell, you know, it's totally swelled up. I'm like, well, was it worth it? You know, or, you know, now you learned your lesson. So it's very individual, but a lot of communication. I don't like them to go, you know, months without talking to me. Um, because then if something goes wrong, I have to do all that detective work to try to um, fix it. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thanks. Sure. Okay, there was a hand that went up. Michelle. Uh, hello, thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation. What would you suggest for someone who has uh, weak connective uh, tissues? I'm talking about um, 
uh, herniated discs, bulging discs, and things like that. What would you do? Uh, what would you suggest when an injury happens like that to make sure that the pain doesn't go uh, chronic? Thank you. Sure, sure. Um, thanks for. I'm glad you enjoyed the presentation. So you're not thinking about something like a disease like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, where these are people that have um, genetically hypermobility syndromes. Some people. Right, they just might be lifelong gymnasts and dancers, and so they're already super limber. And those can be difficult because they do have um, hypermobility that we now have to strengthen. And that's where I think PT works really well is if you have a good physical therapist who can assess the situation, and be like, okay, this is what's wrong. We need, you know, um, we need to strengthen the the ligaments around that joint. We have to strengthen the paraspinal muscles to keep you upright. If they're having a lot of herniated discs, um, you know, again, I'm not in practice anymore to do, well, I am in practice, but not physically to do the manipulations. I actually try to find someone in the area, whether it's going to be a medical center like University of Washington or a chiropractor who has a traction device. And these are um, usually computer generated, right? It's, it's kind of like the old, you know, medieval things you would think of that you get these weights put around um, your ankles, and then usually a strap around your chest. And it literally pulls you to a certain degree in each visit. It goes more and more. So that disc goes back in, but that's only the beginning. Then everything that surrounds that, right? The paraspinal muscles, um, the larger muscles that help with movement, those need to be strengthened and stabilize the spine. So they're not keep coming out. That also being said, I will give them things to strengthen connective tissue, like salmon cartilage or some kind of bovine cartilage, MSM, um, you know, N-acetylglucosamine. There, there's, there's a products product out there that I did formulate, again, no royalties, that's great for connective tissue repair called Matrix with two Xs, and it is Biology Research Group. Um, I will usually add in that and then the cartilage um, builder um, some times with people, I end up sending them to someone who does uh, prolotherapy uh, or even PRP uh, if, if they can afford it and they talk to the practitioner to speed things up. So hopefully that helps. Yes, thank you, it does, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Todd, do you have um, an end slide where you've got all your contact information? Uh, no, I have the home slide, which has, sorry. Okay, There's so this I'm one. going to suggest, okay, leave it there for the duration of any other questions. Okay. Um, there's one here um, for young children with digestive issues and anxiety and discomfort and pain. How do you manage the pain while working on the GI issues? So that most of my answers you've already caught on, they're, they'll default to homeopathy, right? Homeopathy will usually get rid of the anxiety, get rid of the GI issues, but it's also underlying causes. Um, you know, is it that they're anxious that's causing them to have GI distress or is it, you know, that they're distressed and they don't really know how to interpret they're six years old. They don't really know how to explain what's going on. So I, I need to help elucidate that. And with kids, everything, what, what's nice about kids is that they're not like adults where they've just had years of life beating them down, where they've got this monster problem list where children respond very quickly to just about any intervention at pretty low doses, not just because of the size of their weight, because they're just their children, their vitality is so strong. Um, I, I used to practice a lot of craniosacral therapy, um, which I, I don't anymore. Not even when I was in a physical practice, it was time consuming. And then, um, so now I just send to people who do it all the time, usually, you know, a traditional osteopath, but also um, the trick to children is getting stuff into them, right? Getting them to actually take something. That's one reason why the gummy market, supplement market has exploded, right? You can find gummy everything, gummy CBD, gummy, what are you, everything's in a gummy. And part of it is that adults also don't like swallowing, but most of it's for kids. The, the drawback of gummies is that there's not much of the active ingredients. You got to eat a lot of them and some of them have a lot of sugar. But with kids, I also want to find out what's going on. And I don't like poking children, you know, phlebotomy unless I have to. So I might try to say, well, let's do a stool test. Maybe let's do a breath test if I'm thinking they got H. pylori. And then going down that road, of, do they actually have a sliding hyalur hernia that would only be really found on, you know, in a, you know, basically someone getting scoped. But usually with them, it's trying, and then food, 
you know, it's almost always a food thing for them. Talk about what's going on at home. So I know I'm kind of throwing a lot at, a lot at you, but systematically for me, it's constitutional homeopathy, talking to the parent, talking to the child, what's going on. And then ultimately it's going to be the allergy elimination diet, which many times is tricky because when kids go to school, you can only watch your child while they're at home. They go to school, they're eating all their friends' lunches. They're like, sweet, potato chips. So with that, sometimes it ends up being the IgG diet. So pain, like in adults though, is usually a big motivator for a child. And if they have pain, um, I'm starting to, if they have chronic pain, I'm, I'm starting to think that, do they have something like juvenile arthritis? So I'm usually gonna send them to rheumatology, a pediatric rheumatologist to get an accurate workup so I have an accurate diagnosis because they're going to run. I don't, don't normally run then kind of go from there. And then, yeah, the game is just trying to get stuff into them because they don't want to take anything. Some of the herbs are horrible. You know, I like to hide things in sauce. I like to hide things in soups. If they eat it. Smoothies are another big one. Or even some kids, what, what I'll do, or even adults is uh, I get, say, go get some organic Concord grape juice pomegranate juice, something that's got a very strong flavor, pour an ounce in a shaker cup, put the stuff in there that whatever I'm prescribing, shake it up and have them drink it real fast. And that way they, they just end up doing it and pain motivates them. But yeah, kids can be tricky when they don't want to take anything. That's the brilliance of homeopathy. They love the sugar pellets. That's it. All right. Thank Good. you so much for being here. You've got multiple rave reviews at the end. Oh, great. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Take care, guys. Everybody be safe and happy holidays. Appreciate it. Bye. Take it. Bye.